Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk today. Um, we've been briefly introduced, but that's just so, just so that we are clear. I'm Jessica. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And today we have the very great honor and pleasure to talk to you about uh, RGA's work for Founderland. Yeah, so hi, I'm the managing director and co-founder of Founderland. We're a nonprofit organization. Um, and we actually, my two co-founders, who are women of color, are not here with me today, but they met in 2019 at an accelerator program. So the three of us are all multiple-time founders, and um, I don't know if any of you have ever been at a tech conference, but on most of those main stages, there aren't very many women, and there's hardly any women of color. And they wanted to change that, and that was back in 2019. Fast forward, COVID, so we had this idea for Tech in Color to be a big conference, but it wouldn't be branded as a conference for women of color founders. It would just be an awesome conference, but on every main stage, there would be a woman of color. And um, yeah, that didn't happen because of COVID, so we had to go back to the drawing board. And what we did is we just created a website matching investors who want to diversify their pipeline and founders, women of color founders, who really need warm intros. Because the fact of the matter is, is that women of color founders are under-resourced and underfunded. So... You need that one. I need this one, that's right. So, as we know, in the world of startups, funding is everything. But unfortunately, venture capital is mainly going to white men. Less than 0.5% of venture capital dollars go to women of color-led teams. And the funny thing is, is that if we invested in women entrepreneurs, we could boost the global economy by 5 trillion US dollars. So, <laughs> it's going to be a joke to this. Um, so, Alina, Deborah, and Steph were like both, or all the three of them, are actually successful founders uh, already on their own, set really out to change that. And uh, yeah, they founded Tech and Color. Back then, it was still called Tech and Color. But unfortunately, that nonprofit, like, visually didn't cut um, through the noise. So, yeah, okay. Um, so you can see them right, like right there in the middle. Um, great idea, but not such a great brand design as of then. So enter RGA. Um, RGA's brand purpose is creating businesses and brands for a more human future. And one way to prove this is not just by our paid work, but also by our pro bono work. So we have an initiative that is called Make Good. Um, it's run by my dear colleague, Beina Black, out of the New York office. And it's our sustainability, social impact, and volunteering program that actually enables every RGA across the globe to use their talent, time, and skills for good. And inside that initiative sits Make Good for Businesses. And that is very, very concretely aimed to help close the racial wealth gap by providing BIPOC businesses and organizations our services in an effort to assist in their growth. So that can be digital services, brand developments, campaign services, etc. And one thing to add, which is really cool, is that when they were launching this pilot program with the Berlin office, we we're lucky enough to meet one of the strategy directors who came to us because we have all of these women of color founders who the Make Good for Business program serves. And they said, hey, do you have any founders that you, or business startups that you think we could support with this program? And we said, maybe ours? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it was a really great initiative for them to support because not only are they supporting us, but they're supporting all of the founders that we support. So it had a multiple, multiple effect. Yeah. Yeah, and um, as Steph just mentioned, it's the, like, Tech and Color became the Make God for Business partner of the Berlin office, but it also became the global guinea pig for that initiative uh, in general. And yeah, it uh, has been a great success so far. So let's go on to the journey with us of becoming Founderland. Um, let's start with the setup. Founderland was actually created by an amazing team of uh, women, uh, all-female team, actually, um, in Berlin, 
the back then tech and color ladies, uh, plus support from actually, I think, almost every RJA office around the globe. Uh, because it was a really like an um, amazing idea and everyone was just like, yeah, how can I help? What can I do? So uh, there's this great team of women and I'm very like honored, I have to say, to be standing here today on their behalf uh, to present the uh, design side of things. So um, the interesting thing is that, as I said, it's made good, it's pro bono, which means client doesn't pay anything, but of course, um, the design team and the strategist, whoever's working on it, they have to continue on paid work. So it's running in parallel to paid work, a very specific way of working in sprints. So you'll have high client engagement, presentations every other or every week. And only if you're lucky, like one day of like fully dedicated work, and then it's just like continuing into the next sprint. So it's like really fast project. Um, really intense, but uh, very, very uh, nice to work on. So um, I have to say one other thing yeah. that was really helpful with the speedy process, because it was the first time we had worked with an agency in this <laughs> way. It was very organized. So um, RDA came to the table with the most, they were the most organized partner we've ever worked with. So we knew exactly what we were expecting to get out of every single session, which helped us kind of figure out how we were going to move forward with whatever sprint we had at task for that moment. And I think Jess will now go into how they deliver these expectations. Yeah, so that's um, may maybe true to the, or coming out of the fact that uh, RGA was initially a film production company. So until today, like everything that's in here would be called project managers or producers, and they're really producing. So they're like super strict and straightforward plans. So when I'm talking about here the creative side of things, there's of course always strategy, client service, and production involved to just really responsible for steering that project through this like 12 week sprint. Um, process that was running along these four Ds that you can actually see here. So that's well established how we work. There's the discover the opportunity phase, the define the concept, uh, the design the vision, and then deliver the actual artifacts of the work. So there's a ramp up phase um, that is really just going into getting a deeper understanding of what's the brand, what's the business. Um, what's the landscape around that? Who's the audience? And it's about identifying also challenges, opportunities, and capitalize on them as a basis for the actual clear brief. So we'll be writing our own brief at the end of that phase, basically. Um, then in the next phase, it will be about defining the concept, which is not the design concept. So it's like, really, where do we want to go? What's the core strategy? Um, what are the concepts that we want to build upon? to um, really work on the opportunities that have been identified in the discovery phase and, of course, always based on the uh, scope of work and the prioritized ask. So um, it's pro bono, so we couldn't do like everything, everything that we wanted to do, but always providing, let's like, say, um, the best for uh, our clients to, to continue working with we afterwards. Yeah, we always talked about it as an MVP, yeah. everything, MVP playbook, MVP brand, <laughs> MVP everything. But <laughs> in the end, you'll see it's much more than an MVP. Yeah, and um, after that, once the foundations are clear, we'll go into the designing, the actual vision phase, when you work with all the design territories and really creating the first tangible assets, bringing the concept to life. And the last phase is actually delivering the artifact. So in that case, uh, a lot of the MVP uh, <laughs> things. Um, so let's jump right into them, starting with the discovery phase and the opportunities that were identified there. So some more acronyms. Um, we started with the four Cs, so that's also a well-known uh, way to do it. Um, looking first, of course, at the bigger picture. So looking at the category. Um, what are other in the companies in the market doing, other initiatives, um, what's the level of involvement, what can we learn from them actually, because it's like <laughs> they're market leaders, for example, they have to be, there has to be something that they're doing right. So what can we draw from that? Um, again, zooming out, what is culture at the moment? So what are like social conversations that are happening? What are megatrends? Um, what is just relevant? And uh, what is happening right now? And then zooming a little bit more in again, 
the customer. So who do we want to be talking to? What's our priority audience? What are their needs? Where are they? How do they behave? What media do they consume, et cetera, et cetera? And of course, ending with the company. So in that case, tech and color. Um, and connect the observations with the products and with the brand, what's in them, what are their strengths, et cetera. So to really understand what would work uh, for them. And at the end of that discovery phase, we came to these like six main findings. So the first is that we really, really wanted to support women founders in Europe and the UK uh, who have faced obstacles tied to their ethnicity and race in their startups journeys. So something that actually Alina and Deborah had like experienced firsthand and that was really um, that everyone like who's involved in that project uh, wants to change. Um, and I think it's important yeah. to note that we were really focused on this particular region because at this time, if we can kind of zoom out to the context, this is, th this is all happening right after George Floyd mm -hmm. was murdered. There was a reinvigoration of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we wanted to sort of really, really focus on a group that hadn't been served mm -hmm. um, in this ecosystem. So we, in our discovery, there was a lot of conversations about why not just make it for women? Women only receive 2% of venture mm -hmm. capital. And we truly believe that if we focus on the most marginalized, so the women who receive the least amount of funding, then it will have benefits for all women. But if we only focus on women, it will truly most likely only have an impact on the women who are, have the most proximity to the dominant group. So we can talk about that more, but let's mm -hmm. continue <laughs> into the discovery. <laughs> yeah, because like we might end in, uh, with a little bit of a conversation around why yeah. we have like two white women standing here on the stage representing that. But uh, let's discuss this at the end. Um, so the second finding basically was around the goal. Um, we wanted really to have tailored support to create opportunities for our founders at every stage of their startup journey. So no matter where they are, um, it's always beneficial to be uh, enrolled in Founderland. And um, we wanted to use community as a tool, so that's also something special. As Steph mentioned, in the, found or in the startup world, it's, it's about connections. So it's about who you know, it's about getting the warm introductions, and um, really wanted to leverage the power of the community which is like in that regards really changing or challenging the very foundations of the venture capital world um, because like we want to do it for women of color founders and we really need to stand out which is just like this, the fifth finding so we need to take a stand or in order to take a stand we need a design and an identity that's like really standing out of the crowd uh, we need a new name, so tech and color <laughs> obviously wasn't, wasn't it. Um, we need to cut through to be seen. And we need a 12-month action plan to foster our community, educating and engaging uh, both sides. So there was really like, not just, it's not the design, so the development of Founderland was actually much, much more to that. And, and just to add one more thing, I think what's really interesting in contrast to Skoda is that we literally are just starting. So we mm -hmm. were at the very beginning of our journey. So that's a totally different um, scope of work mm -hmm. than when you come in at the beginning as a, as a designer. So it's super exciting to have them build the brand yeah. with us. Yeah, it's just like something net new that's always like such a fun. Um, and Next phase after that, if you have these like opportunities identified and you know where you actually what you're actually working towards, like okay, we need to stand out, we need to be visible, we need to be prominent. It's about defining the strategic foundations by really going into the thing like what's the concept, what's the core strategy, um, what are what we really want to stand for to build on the opportunities that we identified. And it all starts off really with an actionable foundation. And Steph is going to guide you through the yeah. strategy now. So as we said before, it's really important that we knew exactly who we were serving. And so when we came to the who we are, um, we were very um, convinced that we were just going to focus on women founders in Europe who faced obstacles tied to their ethnicity and or race in their startup journeys. Um, we bring founders, allies, and investors together to get more diverse, sustainable, and scalable businesses funded. So what that means is that we're not just focused on serving this 
this group, but we're also focused on the entire ecosystem. How do we actually disrupt systemic change or systemic problems? We have to engage everyone involved into this conversation. So um, you'll see later on how we kind of do that with our products, but um, we also developed a brand purpose, which means that we are building a new standard for entrepreneurs that's not only intersectional, but also inclusive. So we're looking at the ways in which different challenges and privileges affect different people in our community and how we can serve them based on these different standards. Um, and we have four very simple brand principles. We dream big enough to challenge. We're true to ourselves. We work together and we're transparent. And as we all know, a strong brand requires a very strong name. So I will let Jess take it away <laughs> with the naming. Thank you. So um, as said, tech and color wasn't like cutting through the noise, neither visually, but also not in terms of the, of the name. So it was just like, actually, what is it about what are you doing? Um, I think the, the idea behind it was that you were funding mainly like women also in the tech business, so yeah. there was just like um, that like kind of limitation to it um, yeah. as well. So um, based on the, the opportunities that were identified, our verbal design teams actually started off with these like four territories. Um, the first one was behind every great women founder, there is a supportive team of women founders and allies. So we had identified this community aspect and um, this idea is doubling down on this, like, um, working together. There's always someone, there's a network of, of women, as someone to support you, someone to help you. So very, very inclusive and, and helping. Uh, so covering that facet of, of Founderland. And then there was a, a slightly different, a second territory, which was changing the landscape. So this one is a little bit more provocative, as, as Steph said, if you really want to be disruptive, if you want to change things, you have to be um, a little bit more, maybe even uh, aggressive in your language, just pretty straightforward, um, because it says the system is pro broken and we need to change that. So um, you need to be like very, very outgoing with that. So that was another territory. The third one was also quite like strong, um, a call to action, so uh, that every time you say your name, you'll hear our ambition loud and clear. And the, the last one was again on the community side of things, but um, with a little bit different flavor to it. So really about the collective power. So not just the supportive color power, but like really the strength of the power of many, so together we can change uh, things. And um, there was actually a very long <laughs> list uh, that the verbal teams put together that um, all like legally pre-vetted and all of that what comes with uh, creating new names. Uh, super interesting, but of course you cannot like, you have it, you still use it, but it's like nothing that you, uh, you just like hand over, so there was also a shorter list. And um, what we tend to do is to give some few visualizations with the names to just open up the vision of where it could go. So um, starting off, like the first one that was Founderverse, actually. So that's really, um, on one hand side, putting the founders at the very core, which means it's like you, <laughs> you immediately know what, it's a, what the thing the organization is about, right? So like tech and color was just like, mm, what do we do? And as said, we needed to cut through the, through the noise, be really like clear about what we do. So Founderverse, um, also building that like tonality of a new frontier, so provocative, but having this implied sense of place. Then there was Amplify Founders, uh, which is just really uh, going into that territory of like saying loud and clear and supporting um, the founders even with the name. The full spectrum was an evolution of tech and color, actually. So really building on that idea of diversity with the, like the, instead of in color, it was just like uh, really the full spectrum um, of all the founders. Whilst uh, the next one was again a little bit more of this like softer uh, tonality with this like the founder collective, which was a bit, yeah, 
let's say, nicer, right? So it's just yeah. like harmless, maybe, a bit too harmless, maybe. And of course, uh, Founderland, um, the, the last one. And uh, playing with that, again, implied sense of place, so the, the community, the, the one place to go to, the support that this offers. A little bit of the direction of Founder Wars, but uh, slightly toned down, like, on Earth, not in space. Yeah, I think with the naming, we, me, Alina, and Deborah were kind of leaning away from having the name. This is what we mm -hmm. told RGA that we were leaning away from having the name be something that had woman or female in mm -hmm. it, and we would rather um, illustrate that with imagery. So um, the found the Every Founder Collective, even though we liked the naming of it, we felt that it, the the softness of mm -hmm. the of the text of the font was a little too feminine for us. We wanted to be more bold. Yeah, and um, we're not going into the details on that in this presentation, but we also did the tone of voice, and until today, it's like really, it's a lot about wordsmithing and being also inclusive when it comes to language. You might notice that, that we are like very deliberately saying women founders, so we're not talking about female founders, so there's like all these like um, communication and, and uh, the talking with the actual founders and understanding the community of like what is appreciated and what actually isn't. And how can we be as, as inclusive and diverse as possible? So um, there is a lot also to keep uh, in mind there and to, to, yeah, just as I said, be mindful of. Um, you know, they picked Founderland <laughs> of all of these words, but Steph, what did you like about that name? Yeah, so actually, can you go back to the slide before? Yes. I'm so curious <laughs> what people <laughs> here would have chosen. Can I see a raise of hands for yeah. who would have chosen Founderverse? Okay, one. <laughs> who would have chosen Amplify Founders? Okay, maybe seven or eight. Full Spectrum? Okay, getting a little <laughs> bit more hands. The Every Founder Collective? And Founderland? Okay, but maybe that's because they already know. <laughs> we, we can't go back in time. So, um, yeah, we chose Founderland. I actually was more interested in Amplify Founders, mm -hmm. and I think Alina was more interested in Founderverse. And then Deborah, in the final strategy session to decide on a name, Deborah at the last minute <laughs> said, you know, I'm really leaning towards Founderland because imagine if we can create a whole land for these women. They never had a place, they weren't seen, they were invisible, and now we're building a whole land for them. And then my ears perked up and I thought, wow, that's actually, she's kind mm -hmm. of enrolling me in her vision, even though I was really strongly set on Amplify Founders. So then we started riffing on this and thinking about what we could do. We can create passports for our next conference and we can create flags. And, and then mm -hmm. yeah. it just went on its own. Exactly. Took off. So um, that name inspired really a bold idea. So the verbal design colleagues, again, good to work, and uh, yeah. came up with this, huh? I'm happy to read this. Um, I remember when this was first handed to <laughs> us and we all had the chills. So Founderland, even though I'm wearing my glasses, I have to get close up. Um, a place without borders and boundaries where everyone is welcomed and celebrated a place to put down roots and grow strong, proud, tall. It's like nowhere you've ever seen before. We lead where everyone else follows. We set a new standard. This is not business as usual. We dream bigger and do better, and we claim space without apology. We put money where it matters. We put community first and check egos at the door. We build for ourselves and for those who will come after us, changing the game as we go. This is your land. This is Founderland. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to pass that applause on to the colleagues in Sydney and New York. Um, so that Actually, this manifesto then was our starting point for the next two phases, the design division and deliver the artifact phase. And uh, we again kicked off with territories. So I said this like pro bono um, sprint says just like a lot of interaction. So you cannot, you don't have time, so you cannot lose or waste time actually. So it's a lot of interaction and exchange um, with the clients, with just like not inside the pro bono work only, but like whenever we, we work with clients. 
And it's just, it, it, since it had to be so fast, it was just like very, very quick design sketches that the team did to identify, okay, what do they actually like, right? So, and, and where do we want to take it? Around different territories. So the first um, played around with the idea of actually finding, so framing, highlighting, uh, just like identifying and elevating um, aspects in the design. As the second one is again also about emphasizing, so um, really putting her in the center of attention. Whilst in the third one it was about this like found forward, so um, progression and always just like change, moving forwards. With the third, uh, fourth one being called her land, so that played with the individuality of the founders. How can this be brought in? It's like changing fonts. And also already very distinct and bold and bright colors. Um, that while another one was playing around with uh, introducing symbols and uh, yeah, just like working more with the graphic language, to something that is again a bit more playful, if speaking of foundations or uh, connections. And you actually like ha were a lot involved, right? Yeah, and just so like sending over mood boards and stuff. Yeah, so we were really involved with this process. We had sent them a whole Pinterest board of brands and uh, word marks and logos that we really liked and symbols. And um, based on what they had given uh, the assets they had submitted to us before, we sort of thought, okay, maybe we need to give them a little more information. And then they delivered on on that promise because like we had the supreme. Um, logo is one of <laughs> our logos and there was a logo that had a, um, an arrow and there was a logo that we submitted that had this curve in the font and the word mark and also like this button so they kind of delivered to us what we had submitted as inspiration in their own way and that was really cool to see how they really took what we had submitted and kind of turned it around very fast <laughs> yeah but obviously like none of these just like already hit the uh, kind of the nail and it was coming back to the manifesto and uh, also a lot of exchange with uh, you found a land ladies that then just like really um, made sure that one thought prevailed. And that is instead of just building a design system, we set out to build a place, um, the actual founder <laughs> land. So the entire identity uh, actually is that one of a country. Um, we really wanted to create a brand that was bold, celebrates the individuality of the founders, and of course, like just is connecting to the new name. And now I have to go over there because I have to read out the brief, uh, because it's one of the best Sorry, briefs you. you can get as a designer, because you said, we want the bold, confident, oh, yeah. unapologetic, trustworthy, aspirational, cool, FOMO-causing design. So <laughs> that's just like, uh, not so easy to fulfill, it's fun to work on, nevertheless. And the solution was to create a flexible brand system that's inspired by flags, building playfully on Founderland's amplified sense of place. And there's a toolkit of symbols we'll be talking about in a second that um, allows Founderland to actually uh, emphasize topics that are relevant for them, and not just Founderland, but also the founders themselves. So. We created a system that allows every founder to create their own identity as well uh, inside the Founderland network. So uh, starting off with the logo, we've said Founderland is about diversity, right? So also the Founderland logo comes in all shapes and sizes. Actually, everything inside the Founderland yeah, <laughs> moves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, it, because it's a design made for digital, it's also made a lot for social media because that's one of the, the most important channels actually that Founderland is, is um, yeah, working in and that needs to gain attention. So um, very flexible logo system on that end. Um, you might recognize the arrow, symbol of choice um, from some of the previous iterations, really amplifying this idea of like moving forwards. Then there is this like kit of symbols and every founder, once they get into Founderland, can pick three of them. So they're really to express their own identity and uh, to connect maybe with others who share the same interests. So Founderland is a network. It's about making connections not only to investors, but also between the founders. So it's just like really a living organization, right? So uh, in that case, 
Nicole is powerful and is interested in growth and is very energized. So there are overlaps with others. And so everyone can create their own individual um, kind of like design. That's Alina, one of the other co-founders, and uh, her identity, for example. So there's a lot to play with. You might recognize the blue has been kept as one of the, uh, the elements of tech and color. Uh, I think that's mainly the only one thing that was the only thing. <laughs> like kind of kept in that new, net new uh, design. So, oh, sorry. Uh, the color palette is also something that you've seen in the, in the first iterations, very bright, very like much standing out, uh, centered around black and white, but with these like more um, brighter and vivid colors, um, very, very, very uh, intense. Um, Founder Lens is a nonprofit, so needs to be mindful of uh, money. Uh, that's why typography fonts were chosen that are free, so Hansen and Space Mono are uh, the two ones of choice. Mm -hmm. oh. The design system is super simple. So uh, Founderland is not like Skoda. It's not like when it's not a corporation. We can be a bit more flexible, and um, it's really very very visual. So the strengths are the symbols, are the colors. It's putting this into these very boxy layouts. And the cool thing is you can hardly go wrong with that. So you don't need a lot of rules. We have a playbook, we'll later on go to that. It's like um, pretty intense by now, but a lot is about tonality and the strategy. So the design is super, super quickly uh, explained. You just have to flip through it and look at it, and then you just like rebuild it, and it actually um, works. Uh, we have to also, because as it's pro bono work, so we always put on a different designers with every new uh, engagement. So luckily, we continue to work beyond the design with, uh, with Founderland. And um, you cannot lose time in onboarding. So it's just uh, really taking a look. How does it, uh, what are the layouts? What are the, the references? And just like recreate them. And uh, that's the very cool thing about it. Also, designers uh, like to work with it a lot. Yeah, and also our social media content person, mm -hmm. she's not a trained designer. So yeah. She does everything in Canva, and it's super simple for her to manage this brand. So it's super playful as well for social media. Said almost everything like kind of moves, um, and we can also create these like very impactful uh, layouts here with just these like squares that are um, lining up and, and building layouts. Can be more flexible as well, so the symbols are really, really a nice way of handling it and combining them um, with inclusive imagery. Not always so easy to find for black and brown people, for example, so we had to also dig up a few platforms for that. Luckily, uh, we have our US colleagues who help with that, so there's a platform called nappy.com where you get like nice imagery in that sense. So that was just, again, always uh, good to leverage the power of the RGA uh, network. And um, as I said, symbols, cool, in digital space, can be just like put onto almost everything, but also in the real world. So be it pins or stickers or something, you can just like really play around. Actually, the stickers you, you, you do have, right? Yeah, so we use them for <laughs> our gifts, put them on the boxes, yeah. So, are we here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> It also, uh, the design system is also great for web design, right? So it's super simple, um, but very impactful. And you can actually just like customize everything with it because that's a Squarespace template, right? Yeah, so we were using a certain Squarespace mm -hmm. template at the time and we knew that we didn't have the funding at the moment to mm -hmm. really hire a designer to completely build this beautiful brand. So RGA took that template and built us a prototype that we could very easily put into the template on Squarespace, so that was Yeah, so nice. it's always about helping Founderland to help themselves, kind of, so it's uh, really a, a good, good way to collaborate by providing these MVP uh, products, actually. So it's made for digital, but of course it works uh, for print, and we can easily flex from this like super impactful uh, focus on the name uh, to focus on the founders to like playing around with the symbols. Um, that's that's really really nice to work with, super playful. And as I said, you can like hardly do anything like brutally wrong as long as you have like kind of a design eye. 
And um, the name also implies these like cool ideas for swag. As you said, you had these like passport ideas, and it's like, like either it's the flag as a scarf, or said this like passport that contains the tickets to the founder land, actually. Um, and it doesn't just stop there. So luckily, Foundland is uh, growing beyond the, the corporate design development into uh, actual products. And they're also inspired in naming by that um, sense of place, like with the uh, compass and the beacon, right? You mm -hmm. took those from the long list of names. Then. Yeah, so um, compass is our accelerator program. When we started with Tech and Color, we actually were just, we only had 30 founders mm -hmm. in our community back in the day. That was not that long ago. Um, but we saw uh, a funding announcement um, for the Google.org Impact Challenge for Women and Girls. And even though we had just started, we thought, well, if we don't apply, we'll never know. And we applied, and out of 8,000 applications around the world, we were one of 34 organizations to get funding, which is how mm -hmm. we're funded now until the end of 2025. And one of the main things that we get to do is this accelerator program. That's what we applied with. And it's basically a five-week program where we accept up to 16 founders who are ready to raise venture capital within the next six to 12 months. And we get them in, in conversations with investors, doing role play, negotiation training. And the truth is, is that myself, Deborah, and Alina have done collectively over 10 accelerator programs. So we wanted to create a program that we didn't have. And what we were missing is this real engagement with, the, with our community on how we can get, you only get good at pitching by practicing. So that's really like the core of Compass. So Compass is really finding your North Star when it comes to pitching and when it comes to role playing and no negotiation training. So that's where we got, we landed on Compass. Yeah. And that's uh, the purpose, right? Yeah, the purpose is supporting women entrepreneurs with ethnically diverse backgrounds to get ready for investor conversations. Nice. And we got the honor to not just do uh, the name as it existed, of course, based on that list, but again, a tone of voice, how do we speak to, to the founders, how do we get them into the program, but also uh, the design of the program, because it had to build on the founderland identity. And it was done in um, one of the, uh, the, the smaller uh, sprints work that we do. So um, again, one day per week over four weeks. So it's just like really, really condensed. So everyone working on it, four days, um, to come up with the identity, the tone of voice, the strategy, purpose, everything. Um, here you can see it's not using like um, multiple symbols, but just like this one symbol for Compass, of course, because we're not talking about the individual founders and their, what they stand for, but really using that like Compass needle um, to, to underline the idea of like r navigating your way in the startup landscape, actually. And um, it's focusing more on black, so the design needs to be based on found land, but nevertheless stand out a little bit more um, because it needs to be identifiable just on the website that now you're entering the, the, the compass space um, there. So that was uh, great fun. And I said team then changed. Uh, we are very often put um, junior designers or younger team members on the founder land assignments to help them as well learn and grow because you're an amazing client. <laughs> it's just like they're so nice, super, super fun to work with them. And this is also great for us as an agency to have this like program um, where the, the, the ju more junior members get client exposure and really also need to, to focus themselves on the work because of this very restricted schedule but um, have this with a, or you can experience this with a design that is just like super, super great fun. So it's a win-win situation, uh, like really actually. And then there's uh, not just Compass, but there's also uh, Beacon, right? Yeah, so with Beacon, we're really looking at how we can engage the investors in a conversation around what it means to actually be a real ally and to actually allocate funds to the women in our community. So we decided we wanted to create a collective, so that's called Beacon Investor Collective, and Beacon being this, that they are the guiding light. They are, they are lighting the way for other investors to follow in this new movement of not just <laughs> investing in the same old, same old person every single time. Because the truth is, we only know, uh, 
our hypothesis is if you invest in a different type of founder, then we can see change in our world. If you keep investing in the same type of founder, then we're going to get more of the same. So we need to give ourselves a chance to invest in new types of founders coming from different backgrounds with different ideas. So that's what Beacon's all about. Yeah, and that's how it looks. So Beacon, as I said, is not targeted towards the, the founders directly, but it's made to attract investors. So it needs to uh, live in a slightly different context. Um, that's why we decided to go for these, like, the boldest contrast that actually exists in the Foundland color palette. And the symbol is playing around with the idea, of course, of the light that the beacon actually sheds, but also with the idea of a megaphone, of like really amplifying the reach of the founders by getting funded, by getting the connection with the investors, and also by the in for the investors on the other side, because as Steph said, it's about diversifying their like pipeline, of diversifying like the, the um, kind of people they work with, and um, a lot of also bigger companies have these in their, in their goals today, like to work on that basically. So um, it's, it's a it's super great thing to just like also be seen and get the attraction of those companies. And um, that's why it's so loud again, can work in the context of finance. So it's not just like totally off, but it's still like totally different. Yeah, the their job is to make the invisible visible yeah. with this light. Exactly. So, very iterative process, the entire creation, of course. I mean, most of the design companies most likely do it by now, but it was created totally remote uh, in Figma. Um, we have an intuitive playbook that is, it lives in Google Slides because, like, there is, we cannot set up an, this, like, a big technical platform, but it's nevertheless, it can be edited by Founderland at the same time, uh, like, like from RGA just lives there um, and iterates. <laughs> it's a living document, super nice, and uh, just made to be uh, intuitive, basically. Just look at the things, you can see there are very little, uh, very few description actually needed. So um, that's really the nice thing when you're designing for uh, something like Founderland to create like a, a the designer's catnip piece. And um, yeah, I think like it's an overview, um, gets pretty visible that hopefully we achieved <laughs> the brief, <laughs> we met it. Um, who believes we did? Yeah? <laughs> <It's good. laughs> no, hey, stop. Uh, two more minutes. No, two more minutes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just like a uh, scene <laughs> applause. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like really just as an, as an overview. So because we're going to go into uh, another little round of uh, results, right? Yeah. And uh, because we believe the design landed on the purpose. Yeah, hopefully. we definitely exceeded our purpose. Um, so let's go to the yeah. results. So as I said, when we met, when we started working with RGA, we had 30 to 40 founders, women of color founders, and now Today, actually, because we have bi-weekly cycles of applications that we go through, and today we are over 500 women of color founders um, in 26, oh, <laughs> in 26 <laughs> countries across Europe. And we have 130, over 130 investors who've signed up to join the movement and over 150 allies. And now allies exist to offer their pro bono support, whether they're marketing, product, tech, um, they can sign up on our website and yeah, support in any way they can, whether it's one hour a month or more. They can do one-to-many workshops or one-to-one. -one. It's really flexible, just like our brand system. And so <laughs> if you are excited about what we're doing and you want to support us, you can join Founderland if you're a founder um, who's faced obstacles tied to your ethnicity and race and you identify as a woman. You can also join as an ally or an investor super easy just go to our website and also just want to <laughs> plug our Instagram we're doing pretty good on LinkedIn we're almost at 7,000 followers which mm -hmm. is pretty exciting but on our on our Instagram it's it's we want more followers so follow <laughs> us it's <laughs> help us help you um, at founderland underscore and yeah, yeah, I think. And for all of the designers in the room, so I know a lot of students here, uh, it's actually also really pretty cool to watch it. So it's just like also uh, just a visual inspiration. So 
Happy to hear your thoughts, answer your questions now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.